So why don't we uh, why don't we begin with a prayer and we'll begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the many blessings that you give us, especially the blessings of this season of Advent and through the Christmas season. And we pray, dear Lord, that you'll help us to to uh, to spend time reading and reflecting and uh understanding more deeply uh, in our own spiritualities, in our own lives, uh, the profound effect that the events of 2000 years ago, Christmas have for us. We pray that you continue to help us to open our hearts, to be open to your spirit during this, uh, during this presentation and during the season that we might be able to prepare a place for Jesus to be born in our hearts again this year. We ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, as I've done each of the uh, night two and night three, again, I'd like to begin by offering a brief review of what I have, uh, what we've done. I will um, start the slideshow here. And then uh, of course, uh, again, this is the, uh, this is the, um, the, the sort of romantic image of Bethlehem that we all have. The image of the, um, the image of the village uh, over which the star shone, uh, over which the star shone on the uh, on the night or at the time of Jesus' birth, uh, we think of it as a small village out in the middle of the desert. And of course, it was at that time uh, some ten miles southeast of Jerusalem. Uh, the journey to Bethlehem, the the most important journey to Bethlehem, of course, is the Bethlehem is the journey of Mary and Joseph uh, at the time of the at the time of the census that was called by Caesar Augustus, according to Luke chapter two. And, uh, but this is not the journey that I focus on. That journey made possible the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, at least as, as Luke tells the story. And, uh, but it's other journeys that I think uh, help us to understand more deeply. And I started with two biblical, story, two biblical journeys, uh, that of Ruth and Samuel. Ruth and Samuel uh, their journeys to Bethlehem, as recorded in the, the book of Ruth in the Old Testament and the, book, the first book of Samuel in the Old Testament, were related, to, uh, were related to David and David being born in Bethlehem. So Ruth was his great grandmother. In many ways, she's responsible for the fact that David was born there because she moved from Moab to Bethlehem uh, and there met her husband, Boaz. Uh, they bore Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse and Jesse of David who was anointed king by, by Samuel the prophet. And Samuel, uh, the story is told in the 16th chapter of Samuel, uh, Samuel uh, was a very obedient to God and anointed David. So those Old Testament stories uh, are really more about going to Bethlehem uh, and, and the birth of, of David, the, the, the golden age king of the United Kingdoms of Israel and Judah, uh, a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. And of course it worked its way into prophecy uh, Micah, the most famous prophecy about Jerusalem, about Bethlehem, that uh, that the Messiah would be born there. The leader, the one that God had chosen to lead His people, uh, would be born there. And that point, that prophecy, some 300 years after the birth, after King David, and 700 years before the birth of Jesus, were um, were it point it points back to King David and forward to Bethlehem, and then. Uh, then we looked at the gospel, the gospel stories, uh, stories of the new covenant, and the two uh, journeys that I focused on were those of the Magi and the shepherds. Uh, the Magi, the story recorded in chapter two of, Ma of St. Matthew, the shepherds recorded in chapter two of St. Luke. Then last night, we moved out of the scriptures, out of the biblical era, era into the era of the church. And we talked about St. Helen. Who uh, who went to Jerusalem uh, as part of it went to Beth, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, the Holy Land as part of her uh, uh, campaign to recover the holy sites associated with the life of Jesus, and uh, and she was the one who was responsible for establishing the shrine of the birth of Jesus at Bethlehem, which would become the Church of the Nativity that's that is still present today. The church that she built is not the one that's present today. The one that she the one that she built was burned down. And the one, and this one, the one that's there now has been there for 1,500 years. Then I talked about Saint Jerome and his work of, of translating the Bible 
his work with the word of God and his, the inspiration that he took uh, by doing his work so near where the word made flesh was manifested into the world at Bethlehem, literally in a cave adjacent to the cave in which Jesus was born, the great work that Jerome did uh, to help us understand the scriptures and therefore understand uh, more fully who Jesus was. Then I talked about uh, the, middle, the medieval journey of Francis to Bethlehem uh, and the great uh, influence that he's had on our celebration of Christmas by creating the first creche, making it possible for people to have the experience of going to Bethlehem without going to Bethlehem by recreating a tableau of the birth of, uh, of, the birth of Jesus in their own homes using figurines or using, uh, in some cases, even real people, life-size uh, life-size nativities as that first one was in 1228. But St. Francis has, has left a, an indelible mark on, the, on our celebrations of Christmas today. So again, the prophecy, but you Bethlehem Ephrathah, least among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient times. The prophecy that the Messiah would be born there and then I want to share again the conclusions of each of my each of the journeys that I've talked about. I speak of these in terms of the gifts that those journeys offer us during this season, or ways in which they help us understand more fully our uh, our journey to God and with God, our own pilgrimages. So Ruth's was a journey of loyalty and family, love and charity, trust and providence. These are virtues and principles that we try to live in the Christian life, and they're manifested in this, uh, this story of this young widow who goes back in Bethlehem and uh, as loyal to her mother-in-law, loyal to her mother-in-law's family and way of life. Uh, she becomes one of the great grandmothers of our faith, one of the great, uh, one of the great forerunners or foremothers of uh, Judaism as it was developed in the post-Davidic era, and, uh, and into the Christian era as well. So loyalty, family, love, charity, trust, and providence. Samuel's was a journey of obedience and listening to God. He learned to listen to God more profoundly as he grew up in the temple at Shiloh and developed his own, his own understanding of his vocation as priest, as prophet, and as uh, judge or leader in Israel. And then he was also he was also responsible for mentoring the, the two first great kings of, of Israel, uh, that would be Saul and eventually David. He's also one who prepared the way for the Lord by hearing the that God had rejected Saul and wanted to wanted uh, David as his king, and he went to prepare the way by anointing David so that the Holy Spirit rushed upon him as it had rushed upon Samuel and his family as he was growing up. Then I said, what, are the, what, what gifts do the, the journey of the Magi offer us? Well, theirs was a journey of discovery and learning, a journey of seeking the truth. And this is part of our natural human being, that our minds are oriented towards knowing what's true and knowing what's real. And they wanted to discover, and God wants us to discover him in natural phenomenon. And so uh, these Magi saw this star, they interpreted it as something important happening in Judah, and they went as discoverers, explorers to find out what that was. And that should, that should inform the way that we approach our own uh, pilgrimage with the Lord as well. Same with the shepherds, Their, theirs was a journey of faith and believing. They had had the announcement of the angels. They came to adore, to worship this newborn Messiah that had been manifested to them by the angels. And then once they had experienced that, once they had experienced Jesus and having had the experience of the angels, then they told everybody that would listen what had happened. And they went back to their work with great joy, knowing that God had acted in Israel in a, in a remarkable way. And it's the same for us as we experience the presence and grace of God. It fills our hearts with joy and we must tell others about what God has done for us or we have not completed the job. We've only done part of the job. We have allowed ourselves to be influenced by God's grace, but we've not shared that grace with other people. And then together, those two stories, the stories of the Magi and the shepherds, they offer us a, a, a complete understanding of the good news of the birth of Jesus. God calls all, rich and poor, wise and unlearned, simple and complicated, Jew and Greek or Jew and Gentile, that we all have our points of view to this. And the reading of these different stories is not 
to make us wonder which is true and which is not true, but rather to give us a more complete picture of the good news. Uh, moving out of the scriptures, we talked about St. Helen. St. Helen, uh, Helen's journey was a journey of searching and discovery, of conversion and catechesis. She was a new Christian. She was still growing in her own understanding of the faith. And so she grew by her experience of going to the Holy Land and helping to uncover and discover the sites associated with the birth of Jesus. And then hers was a journey of creating pilgrimage sites that are still important Christian pilgrimage sites pilgrimage sites to this day. St. Jerome, who was just, uh, who was, uh, just uh, 50 years later, was in Jerusalem to do his important work of interpreting the scripture. His was a, a journey of love and devotion. He loved Bethlehem. He had fallen in love with it when he visited earlier. He was inspired by being close to where Jesus was born. It was, it was and that was his, it gave him motivation for the work that he was doing. It was a journey of asceticism and self-denial. Self he became a monk and established a monastery there. And it was a journey of being close to the word made flesh, something that each of us should desire and, and move ourselves towards uh, making that Eucharistic connection. The same word made flesh who appears in the, in the, the manger at Bethlehem is, a, uh, is, the, uh, um, is the same flesh, that Je the word made flesh that Jesus offers us in John chapter six as, um, as, uh, as, as eternal life and, and source of life for our journey. I didn't spend time talking about St. Francis and his journeys to the, to the Holy Land. Again, his was a journey of love and devotion. He made that connection of the incarnation to the Eucharist and he wanted to be physically close to our Lord, the babe of Bethlehem. And it was because of his experience in Bethlehem that he, that he would go on later to create the crash uh, which has, as I said, become, become a very important part of our celebrations of Christmas, uh, even in our homes and in our churches today. So those are the journeys that we've looked at so far. And tonight I want to, uh, to come much more recently in history. I want to tell you about my a particular journey of mine to Bethlehem. I'm going to specifically be talking about my journey to Bethlehem at Christmas time uh, in 2014. But before I do that, I wanted to say a few things about, about visiting the Holy Land in general. I first visited the Holy Land in 2009. It was a great blessing. Uh, I spent a summer with uh, Father Carl Slichty and Father Steve Mayakawa, the pastor of uh, the, the current pastor of Holy Family Old Cathedral here in Anchorage. Uh, they are my classmates and we are we are very good friends and this experience of spending the summer together in Israel was uh, was a remarkable time <clears throat> of cementing that friendship and making that friendship even closer. We went there to study. We were we were part of a study program that uh, basically three or four days a week we would be in the classroom studying the gospels and then on the weekend or for three or four days we'd go out and we would travel and we traveled far and wide looking at the connection between the Holy Land, the different places, the different sites, some of them just Jewish archaeological sites, some of them Christian, uh, particularly related to the Christian life. Uh, and it was just a remarkable summer of really growing in our understanding of, of, of the Holy Land itself. Now, I grew up reading the Bible. I'm very fortunate that I, that, that, uh, I, that I, had a, uh, um, I had a love for the scriptures, even as a young person. And so going to, going to Jerusalem, going to the Holy Land, in many ways for me, even though I was already in my 40s at that point, for me, it was like going home. It wasn't, it was the, even though the first time I'd been there, and it was, a, it was the, the fulfillment of a lifelong dream to be able to go, and not just to go for a few days or for a couple of weeks, but to go for a whole summer and be there. And what I discovered was that I would never read the scriptures the same again after walking in the places that Jesus walked, after walking on the shores of the Sea of Galilee uh, and, and walking through the town of Nazareth and going into Caesarea Philippi and walking around the city, the old city of Jerusalem, going to the churches that mark the place where Jesus was crucified and buried, going to the places where Jesus was born, going to these places that are associated with Old Testament, uh, it was, it was a remarkable, remarkable experience. And the scriptures came alive in a way that I could never have imagined them before. 
I never read the scriptures now that the place that's talked about, uh, because, because of my subsequent trips, I've been pretty much all over the Holy Land. And, the, and when I read the scriptures, I immediately have a visual of the, of the geography uh, that's associated with the different stories that I read. And that's a real gift in terms of, in terms of making the reading come alive. Uh, it was a surreal experience the day that we arrived in Jerusalem, excuse me, in Tel Aviv. We were picked up and driven to Jerusalem by friars from the, from the Ecole Biblique. Um, our teacher during this time was Father Gregory Tatum, who also currently lives here in, in Anchorage. And, uh, and so we're driving on the highway, like an interstate highway in the United States, a super highway, going up the hill from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. It's about an hour drive. And we came around this one corner and there was a green highway sign, a directional sign like you see at any exit on any interstate freeway anywhere in the world or interstate type freeway anywhere in the world. And it was a, it was a green directional sign that said Mount of Olives, next exit. And it was, it was surreal. I mean, again, the Mount of Olives is a place that I'd always associated with Jesus's passion, with uh, Jesus's ministry. And, and there's a, here's a green highway sign pointing us to the Mount of Olives. And I would have the similar experiences uh, all during that first trip to the to the Holy Land, but but one of the most remarkable times during uh, during the time that we were there was going to Bethlehem and spending a day, uh, one day, and then eventually we went back for a second day, uh, and and around the places associated with the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. And I knew from that time on that I would return often because I because I had fallen in love with the Holy Land and I was very much at home there. I knew I would turn off him, but one of the things I dreamed of was the idea that maybe someday I'd get to actually spend Christmas in Bethlehem. At that time, of course, I was working in pastoral ministry, and so Christmas is busy time. Christmas is not a time you travel. Christmas is not a time you go somewhere. So I sort of backburnered that idea and thought, well, someday maybe. And it happened for me in 2014. I, after 10 years of being pastor at the Newman Center at the University of Arizona, I was uh, given the opportunity to take a year of sabbatical. And I split my sabbatical into two, into two halves because I wanted, there were two experiences that I wanted to have and I build the rest of the sabbatical around going on those two experiences. One of the experiences was walking the Camino de Santiago in, in Spain. And so I spent half, my second half of, the, of, the, uh, um, of my sabbatical in Spain. And then towards the end of that walk, the Camino. The other, the one that's more uh, important for our topic here was that I wanted to spend Christmas in Bethlehem. And so I spent the first semester studying again at the Ecole Biblique, uh, taking classes, taking scripture classes, spending the, taking the opportunity to travel around and see more of the Holy Land. I'd already done a couple of pilgrimages at that point also. So I'd been back, I'd already been back two times before I was able to go back for this longer stay of five months uh, in 2014. And so it's that journey, the journey, uh, the journey of, uh, of, of my time. Uh, and during that five months that I spent in Israel uh, in 2014, I went to Bethlehem maybe seven or eight times. But the one, the one I want to talk about is going on Christmas Eve. I and a number of, uh, of students from the Ecole Biblique Left, uh, left Israel, or left Jerusalem early in the morning on the 24th and walked from the center of Jerusalem to the center of Bethlehem. That's something between nine and 10 miles. Uh, and it was, it was amazing. There were, so these are the young people that I went with. Uh, the wide eyed guy on the, on the left is, is, Fra is Francois. Francois is a French layman who was studying uh, scripture. Uh, and then on the other side of my head, uh, beneath the Christmas tree is Francisco. He's a, a Portuguese um, Jesuit who was studying scripture. And then Emmeline is a, uh, uh, it was a French woman who was studying scripture, uh, a lay woman. Uh, and so this, this was the small group with whom I was going to make this walking pilgrimage on December the 24th. This picture was taken underneath a Christmas tree that's in Jerusalem. So in the old city of Jerusalem, we stopped by to take a picture there before we headed out. In the old days, the walk from Jerusalem to, uh, to Bethlehem would have been across, through olive fields, very much like this one. It would have been a very bucolic kind of walk, a very pastoral kind of walk, where, where you would have walked through fields and you would have maybe seen some sheep, maybe seen some Bedouin uh, uh, herders out with their sheep. 
uh, and it would be a very it'd be a, a walk through the hills. But since the building of the security wall uh, at the beginning of this century, the building of the security wall separates the West Bank from Jerusalem, from most of Jerusalem, and it cuts off the routes that you would take that would take you through the fields. And so it's basically an urban pilgrimage now. And that's that's what we did. We left early in the day and we walked the streets, the, the, the major highway that goes south out of Jerusalem, the Hebron Freeway. We walked it until until you get to the point where uh, where there is uh, the uh, uh, the gate of the whole uh, and the security wall that allows you to pass into Jerusalem into Bethlehem. Uh, the security wall is open during during the Christmas uh, during the, the the two days of Christmas celebration, so it's easy to get back and forth. There's not the kind of delays that you would have other times of day, but uh, or other times of the year. So you can see this is it's not the same as walking through the fields, but at the, but we're getting there. And this was our this is our walk in our urban pilgrimage. Uh, a few miles from the from the Akolbe Bleak and uh, and about a mile before you get to Bethlehem, uh, there is this archaeological site. What this is is an octagonal church from the Byzantine era. So this was probably from the 600s. And it's called the Church of the Katisma. The Katisma, Katisma means seat. It's the same word, it's the same word from which we get the root for cathedral or cathedra. And what, uh, what is commemorated by this church uh, and the stone right there in the center of the octagons, what's commemorated here is the is a traditional story of Mary needing to rest just before she before they got to Jerusalem. They had been traveling from Nazareth, that's uh, something like 90 miles away. Uh, they had been traveling probably for several days, and she was exhausted, and she was not. She was coming near to the time of uh, giving birth, and and this church commemorates uh, the story of a stop at this place, and and that she rested on that stone that's in the center. And so we stopped there to pray. We prayed the rosary together uh, in, in this spot uh, to kind of get our hearts ready for what we would encounter when we got to Bethlehem. It was, it was really, it was amazing. And actually it was fun being on this site because it's not been developed very much. They discovered it uh, about 30 years ago and this, this, uh, this ruin, and there's, there's been virtually no archeology span that's been done there. So there's even some under the rocks and dirt here, there's some beautiful mosaics. And we were able to see some of that uh, just by being there and sort of moving dirt out of the way. And so uh, there's, there's, art, there's new archeological work all over the place in, in, uh, in the Holy Land. And this is one place that still needs to be developed, but it was great to be there. And uh, that's me kneeling on that stone in the center of the stone where Mary rested uh, I took the opportunity to rest there myself uh, before we made our journey uh, into Jerusalem itself. I spoke about the security wall. This is this is a, an image of the security wall that you can see from the road where we were walking. Uh, the, the security wall is uh, probably 15, 20 feet tall, high, uh, and it's made out of concrete. And again, you can see olive fields there. And on the other side of those fields, those are the buildings of the city of Bethlehem. So Bethlehem grows right up to the wall itself on one side. And Jerusalem goes right up to the wall on the other side. Uh, but that's, uh, that, that wall keeps you, you there's, only, there's only a couple of places that you can cross through that wall into the city of Bethlehem. And the small inset picture there is a picture of the gate that we would go through the security wall to get into Jerusalem, uh, to get into Bethlehem. On the Bethlehem side of the wall, there's a lot of graffiti. Uh, it's, it's considered not only an eyesore, but considered a real uh, insult to the people of, uh, of Bethlehem. And so they decorate it. Uh, you see the, in the picture in the center of the top there, there's a Christmas tree with a wall around it. That's the way they feel. That's the way the people of Bethlehem feel about the wall. Uh, the dove with the, with the bulletproof vest on is a, is a Banksy, um, Graffiti, Banksy, the graffiti artist, uh, has lots of has lots of art on the wall uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, excuse me, in Beth, on the Bethlehem side of the wall, and then that uh, icon of the Blessed Mother. That's on the wall. The wall goes right up to a monastery, uh, a women's monastery, and the the 
the sisters of the monastery painted that icon of the Blessed Mother on the, on, on the security wall where it goes right in front of their gate. Uh, welcome to Bethlehem. So we're, we're, we've crossed through, we're in, the, we're in the city of Bethlehem now. And these are, this, this is a welcome in many languages because of course it's one of the most uh, popular pilgrimage sites in the world. Uh, and so we made our way down and there were cars and cars and cars forever. And it's very, very crowded on uh, Christmas, of course, is the most, the most festive day of the year in Bethlehem. And even though the, most of the population of Bethlehem is, is Muslim now, there are, there's still, I don't know, maybe 2% of the population is Christian. It used to be a place where lots of Christians live, but unfortunately, um, political circumstances of recent years have, have meant that many Christians have chosen to leave uh, because, because life in Bethlehem just became increasingly difficult uh, because of restrictions, uh, security restrictions placed, placed by the state of Israel. And so, uh, so even though it's mostly Muslim now, Muslims also celebrate Christmas. Jesus is a, is a prophet according to, the, according to, the, uh, according to the, the Muslim faith and, and Jesus' birth would be something to celebrate. So the Muslim population is out celebrating as well. And so there are parades and there are, there's a festive atmosphere everywhere. What I got, the sense that I got as I made my way to Manger Square, there's the Christmas tree in Manger Square. And you can see these pictures of the crowds as they're waiting for the patriarch of Jerusalem, the, Christ, the leader of the Christian community of Jerusalem, waiting for him to come and, and um, uh, give them the Christmas, the Christmas blessing and to celebrate mass. Uh, the streets are just filled. The parades, uh, the Boy Scout troops from all over Israel come and, there are bands that come very much the way we would think of a parade uh, in, in the United States today. And then you get to Manger Square and it's just, it's, it's, it's a carnival. I mean, there's, there's booths for food, there's booths for drinks and, and, and just all day long. And so what the sense that I got as I made my way in the early afternoon into Manger Square is that this must have been similar to the crowds that Jesus and, and Mary must have encountered according to the Luke story anyway. Uh, this must have been like the crowds that made it impossible for them to find a place to stay. I also on this trip had my own no room in the inn experience because I had not made arrangements uh, early enough uh, to have a place to stay at one of the monasteries or one of the communities. And, and then I started calling around a few days before uh, trying to find a hotel room even and couldn't find a hotel room because of course it's the busiest day of the year in Bethlehem. Finally, the Dominican sisters who live in Bethlehem and minister there invited me to stay in their convent. And I, I did eventually have a room, but I, for a few minutes, I was having the uh, no vacancy, no vacancy, no vacancy, no room in the inn uh, as well. So we arrived uh, in, the, in the early afternoon. And one of the things that I noticed as soon as we got there was there was virtually nobody near the church. All the festivities were in the street all the festivities were in uh, were in Manger Square, but the approach to the Church of the of the Nativity, there was nobody there. Now this picture was not taken that day. This picture was taken at another time. But this and this square had some barricades in it at that time. But uh, but my habit will get me past pretty much any barricade anywhere, and so in in Jerusalem. And so I just walked past like I knew where I was going and, and I went with my, myself and two of the people that I had arrived with. Uh, we went straight into the church and straight downstairs and got to be in the cave, the grotto of the nativity with nobody else there. It was, which hardly ever happens. It hardly, I've been there a couple of other times where I was able to go in the middle of the night and be there when nobody else was there. But when the church is open, uh, and again, it's because the festivities were in the street at this point, and there would be lots of activity in the yeah. church later on. But I, I made my way immediately there to. Uh, you turn on that. You please turn off your microphone. Please mute your microphone. Thank you. So this again, this these pictures were taken on that day. This is the the main entrance to the Church of the Nativity. That is uh, that is called the Door of Humility. You can see the arch of the original door. Actually, the, the, the lintel of the first door is all the way way above the, the, the flat lintel. And then the medieval door would have been the pointed arch that's there. But in order to keep people from, literally to keep people from riding their horses into the church, they built this smaller door. 
And uh, so it's called the door of humility because you have to kneel down or, or bend down uh, in order to, to get in. So I, I had this picture taken right there in front of the, the sign of the birthplace of Jesus. And then I went into the church and went downstairs to make, to pray and to make my, and to pay homage to the birth of Jesus. The star on the floor of the cave of the nativity, the grotto of the nativity, uh, marks the place where tradition tells us Jesus was born. So uh, this is typical to kneel down, to touch or to, I, I very often when I'm there on pilgrimage, I'll bring rosaries or things and touch them to that so that I give them out as gifts later. Uh, but, and usually because of the crowd, you're rushed through, you're, you can just be down there for a minute. But this night I got to actually be down there and we prayed, we prayed uh, uh, at least a decade of the rosary, we might have even prayed uh, five decades uh, there in the grotto uh, because there were, there were no crowds to rush us out. This is what the this is what that that grot that the star looks like. This is the uh, a picture directly in. You can see there are icons around the back of it, and the star itself marks the spot that tradition tells us Jesus was born. It's always lighted by these uh, Orthodox uh, style lamps uh, and oil lamps. There, keeping it burning bright, keeping the light of Christ burning bright uh, beneath that all the main altar there. We went then into the uh, into the main the the Catholic Church. So there are two churches side by side: the 1500 year old Church of the of the Nativity, and then to the to the left of it, as you're looking at the church, is the Church of Saint Catherine, which is the Franciscan Church. And both of them, both those churches, are then over the series of caves that are underneath where the gr the Grotto of the Nativity is. But inside the Church of inside the Church of Saint Catherine, then there was an evening prayer. Uh, the arrival of the patriarch of Jerusalem, and he led the evening prayer. These windows, uh, one over the altar and one over the main entrance, show uh, show our, Im our stained glass images of the birth of Jesus there, appropriate for this church. So we were there for evening prayer, and uh, an evening prayer was from uh, four thirty to about six thirty. And at the end of evening prayer, all the all the clergy were able to make their way and in procession down from the from the Catholic Church of St. Catherine over to the Orthodox side and down. And then we we prayed the Salve Regina down in the uh, in the, the Grotto of the Nativity. So I'd already been there one time on my own. And now I've gone back for a second time with the priest who celebrated uh, evening prayer. After that, we went, I, I met my friend, Sister Luma, uh, and we went and, and she and some of, some of these students who had come with me went out and we got ourselves some dinner and, and kind of hung out in the street for a little while, waiting until we would be admitted back into the church for, for, uh, for midnight mass. So midnight mass is, uh, uh, is crowded. Everybody wants to go and even priests have to get a ticket. So I was able to request this early enough that I was able to get a ticket. I was one of about a hundred priests that come celebrated the mass celebrated by, uh, by the, um, uh, by the, uh, by the, the patriarch of Jerusalem. So here he is coming into the church for mass. And I, you, I took this picture actually during the mass, that video screen was how we could see things because the, the altar was off to the right of these celebrating priests. But that video screen right there is showing, uh, uh, Abbas, the, the president of the Palestinian Authority, who's the local uh, head of the head of government. And he always, again, he's a Muslim, but he always attends uh, the Midnight Mass, as had Yasser Arafat during the years that he was head of the Palestinian Authority. Again, after Mass, so the Mass was a, the Mass was a Midnight Mass celebrated in Arabic, the local language of the church. <clears throat> and it's interesting. Uh, I, I've been to mass in Arabic a number of times. Uh, when uh, when cr when Christians pray in the liturgy, when we pray to God, uh, the name of God is Allah, and and so it's it's I, uh, falling on American ears. That's uh, it's strange until you get used to it. But but the word Allah simply means God, and so when uh, um, when Christians pray together, they pray Allah Akbar, God be praised, and so. Uh, it's 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 merely a, a, a manner of uh, it's a language it's the language and so uh, it, no less than no less than praying to uh, they uh, um, um, to uh, a Dios uh, in Spanish would be praying exactly the same to exactly the same God in exactly the same way. 
At the end, the blessing of the, the Christ child uh, takes place, and then the patriarch brings the Christ child down into the, down into the grotto. And again, the clergy are all invited to process. So now this will be the third time I've gone down the grotto. Uh, and I took this picture in the procession and the second picture down in the cave itself. Uh, that, that icon in the front of those priests, uh, I'm taking this picture over the head of the priest in front of me. That icon is over the place where the star was. And at the end then, so there's, like, there's a close up picture that icon that I took it another time. And then there, there the baby Jesus is placed on the, uh, on the star itself for a time. And then he's moved over to what's called the altar of the manger. And that's where he'll stay through the, uh, this particular image of the Christ child will stay through the Christmas season. So there the, uh, the patriarch, uh, a, a, a Palestinian named uh, Fouad Tual, he's no longer the patriarch now. Uh, but but uh, Patriarch Fouad uh, prayed, uh, was blessing the, the, the image of the Christ child had been placed there in the manger, at the altar of the manger. After mass, it was already late. It was uh, two o'clock in the morning, but, uh, but Sister Luma and I made our way from, we walked from the, from the church out to the shepherd's fields. So outside of the city of Jerusalem are fields, that have, that have traditionally been Shepherd's Field, but they've become a Christian shrine now. You can see on the gate over the, over the entrance there to the shrine, Gloria and Excelsis Deo, uh, it, and that's the church. Notice on the church, there's a number. It says three by the door. That's the main church. There's a church below. And then there are, I think, 14 other altars that are all throughout the shrine, most of them outdoors. Uh, in, in various little pockets around. There are all these altars. And throughout the night on Christmas Eve, at the beginning of every hour, a mass is celebrated by different groups from all over the world on those different altars. And so when you're there at the beginning of an hour and the mass starts and all these different masses and you're standing there listening, you hear the Gloria, which comes, of course, at the beginning of the mass, you hear the Gloria being sung by these different groups from all over the world in different languages. And it's so incredibly glorious, so wonderful. Uh, the second picture here is with a group of some of the other students who had come from the cold that day. Uh, and and we, we spent some time with them. We had some food with them and then eventually made our way back to, uh, to the convent where I, where I was able to spend the night. We got up the next morning and went into the Church of St. Joseph, which is where the sisters live. It's not, it's not generally on most pilgrimage routes, but the Church of St. Joseph is a church uh, that commemorates the house where, Beth, where, where Joseph and Mary and Jesus lived after, and after the birth. And so if that was their home in Jerusalem, the Church of St. Joseph marks that. And that maybe is where the Magi came to see Jesus uh, sometime after he was born. Uh, and so I went in, we were, we prayed morning prayer there. And then I made my way back up to the church of the nativity. And you can see the, uh, the Christ child under the altar, the main altar of the church of the nativity there that was placed there the night before at the midnight mass. And you can see the, and I went over to what's called the milk grotto, uh, a shrine that commemorates the, uh, the flight into Egypt. And you see that, that image of Mary and Joseph and Jesus uh, fly, fleeing from uh, the persecution of Herod. <clears throat> then, the most remarkable thing happened. I was going to leave and head back to Jerusalem uh, in, the, uh, in the late morning. And I stopped by the sacristy to see uh, a Franciscan that I'd become friends with during that time and to thank him for accommodating me uh, uh, in a couple of different things. Because I was going to be leaving just a few days later. I was going to be leaving uh, Israel and I wouldn't be back in Bethlehem again. And so I went to see Carlos and I, and I, I spent some time talking with him. And he said, hey, there's a group that needs a priest to celebrate mass for them. Their priest got stuck in Jerusalem and can't get over here. And the only problem is their mass will be in Spanish. And I said, well, I can celebrate a mass in Spanish. Where will it be? He said, it's in the grotto. So on Christmas morning, December 25th, 2014, by sheer grace of God, I celebrated the Christmas mass in the grotto at the altar of the three kings 
end the church nativity, completely unexpected, completely unprepared, in a language that's not my first language, but I celebrate mass in Spanish, so it worked out great. And it was such a remarkable gift, such a remarkable experience being there in that place and being able to celebrate that mass for those people. People I didn't know, and it was six, It was a group of six, six people. And uh, by the time of the homily, their priest got there and he preached the homily. And uh, and he allowed me to share a few words as well. And then we continued that we continue celebrating the mass together. And it was just it was it was just such a gift because it was so unexpected. So I didn't leave Jerusalem right. I didn't leave Bethlehem right away after that mass. I went back into the church nativity and spent some time in prayer had some nice conversations with a couple of the Orthodox priests. I went out and spent some time in Manger Square, said my last prayers at the, uh, at the crash that again, that's the crash I've shown you so much during this, during this time, uh, because it became very, very special to me on that trip that I got to pray there in Manger Square at Christmas time. And you can see the, the, the way that crash is at the bottom of that massive Christmas tree. So that's my journey. That's my pilgrimage. That's of, of the 11 or so times that I've been to Bethlehem. This is the, by far the most profound and was so meaningful to me because I went at Christmas. And so when I think about what my journey, you know, if I reflected on the gift that's given to all those different, uh, those other journeys that I've talked about, when I reflect on this, on this time and what my journey has to teach us, I think about the same things that I think about in all those other journeys. Like that of Ruth, mine was a journey of family and returning home, huh? Ruth went back with Naomi to the place that she had come from. And for me, going on Christmas Day was going to a place that I'd grown to love, that I'd grown to love in childhood, reading about it in the scriptures, but that I'd learned to love in my, in my journeys to Bethlehem, in my journeys to uh, the Holy Land as an adult and as a priest, I was returning home. Like Samuel, mine was a journey of vocation and listening to God. My whole time on sabbatical was a time of reflection and, and, uh, and rejuvenation and getting in touch with my own vocation in a new way and knowing that I was going to be doing different things when I came back than I'd done in the earlier part of my priesthood. Uh, it was a time of reflecting on my journey and listening to what it is that God wanted me to do and be uh, when, I, when I came back from that experience. Like that of the shepherds, mine was a journey of adoration and announcing the good news, huh? I had so many great opportunities. I can go on and on. I took 50,000 photographs during the, time that I was, during the time that I was on sabbatical, half of those in the Holy Land, half of them in Spain. But it was, it was such a time of, of sharing with so many other people. Uh, I, I actually now can tour guide in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, in the Holy Land. And so I was able to take people on tours. I took a, a, had the opportunity to connect up with, with, uh, with small groups of people and, and actually lead them on tours. So that was an opportunity for me to preach the good news uh, being there uh, during, during, that, during my sabbatical year. Like that of the Magi, mine was a journey of seeking the truth, uh, always seeking the truth, always wanting to know, uh, wanting to, to grow more profoundly convinced of the, of the truth of the scriptures and the truth of our faith. Like St. Helen, mine was a journey of discovery and seeking places associated with the life of Jesus. As a matter of fact, I've gotten now since my sabbatical, when I go back to the Holy Land, I, I very seldom visit Old Testament sites or sites associated with later history in Jerusalem. I stay really, really focused on the life of, of, of Jesus and the places that are associated with Jesus. And I do so by leading a pilgrimage that's based on the mysteries of the rosary. Like St. Francis, mine was a journey of devotion and prayer loving that place and knowing that God, uh, God has blessed those places richly. Those were, there were places that I went to just spend time in devoted prayer. And then like St. Jerome, I was a journey of love for the Bible and a desire to be close to that place where the word made flesh was manifest in the world. That's what, that's what the, um, the, that, that's what the star of Bethlehem on that floor of that grotto that's what that church, those churches there, that's what the city of Bethlehem means to me. It's that place that we all can go to be close to the word made flesh and his manifestation in the world. So I want to wrap up by talking a little bit about your journey to Bethlehem. Somebody's microphone is on. Uh, I'd appreciate if you'd mute your microphone, please. 
So I want to spend a few minutes uh, talking about your journey to Bethlehem. Uh, as I said last night, I do lead pilgrimages, and so maybe perhaps someday one of, some of you might go with me to Bethlehem, uh, physically, literally go and pilgrimage. But that's not the journey I want to talk about. The journey I want to talk about is the journey that's open to each of us because of St. Francis's forethought and St. Francis's um, uh, helping us to see that it's possible for us to have the experience of going to Bethlehem without ever going to Bethlehem at all. And that the blessing of the creche itself can be a remarkable, uh, a remarkable blessing. If we, if we approach it right, if we approach our, uh, our prayer at the creche in our homes or in our churches and either or, or both, uh, if we approach it right, it can be for us a, that same kind of reminder and that same kind of blessing that actually being there in the place uh, uh, in the place where Jesus was born can be. It becomes for us our little Bethlehem, our place that we make that we make room for Jesus in our own homes and in our churches, in our own spiritual lives, in our own devotion. And so uh, each Christmas, we're invited to pilgrimage to Bethlehem by our celebration of Christmas itself. And what I'd suggest to you is maybe, if you've not already done so, if you put out your creche this year, that you do so in a particular prayerful way and in a particular prayerful order that will help you experience the story as it appears uh, in the scriptures. That you assemble first whatever whatever uh, stable you use, whether it's a wooden stable or it's just some sort of a tableau or some sort of a house, whatever wherever you create, set it out and then put the animals in it and maybe put the hay in it if you use some hay Go ahead and put those things out and just leave it like that without Mary and Joseph, without any other figurines, just the stable as it would have existed on any day that a stable existed, a place where animals stay. Maybe you put the manger there because the manger can, the manger would have been there too. And you, you see it empty. You see it as just a stable, a place where animals are sheltered and animals are fed. And then the next thing you add, maybe a couple of days before Christmas, you go ahead and add, uh, you go ahead in the last Sunday, the last week of Advent, you add Mary and Joseph. And you just add Mary and Joseph. You don't put the baby Jesus there yet. You just leave Mary and Joseph and you allow yourself to see Mary and Joseph and to reflect on their journey to Bethlehem and how they went there and where they found lodging in this place with animals. And then on Christmas Eve, go ahead and put the baby Jesus there. And maybe after you've put the baby Jesus there and you've prayed and you've, you've asked the Lord to bless you and to bless this, to bless this crash, you go ahead and add the angel and the shepherds because the angel then goes to the shepherds and tells them, and on Christmas night, the shepherds come and, uh, and pay homage to Jesus in the manger. And then sometime later, either later on Christmas Day or on January the 6th for the Feast of the Epiphany or sometime in between, you then add the star and the and the and the uh, wise men, and if you add the stars and the star and the wise men, then you've completed the story in a sense. You've added uh, all of the characters. You've got the shepherds and the angels and the star and and Mary and Joseph and the animals, and they're all together there. And you've made it complete, but you've allowed yourself to take a journey with it over time, uh, putting putting the characters in in the order in which maybe they appeared and as they appear in the scripture and allow it to be for you a journey to Bethlehem with each of these characters. So as you, ref as you put Mary and Joseph there, you reflect on their journey. <clears throat> as you put the shepherd and the angel there, you maybe read that part of Luke chapter two, starting in verse eight, where the angel appears to the shepherd. As you put the wise men there and the star, you read Matthew chapter two, excuse me, and the, and the, the, the coming of the wise men and allow the story to unfold uh, in your own little shrine in your home. The, every, Christ, every Christmas is an opportunity for all of us every year to visit and revisit Bethlehem virtually. I hope you can see in your own manger the opportunity to experience the blessing of a journey to Bethlehem. And that during this Christmas time, and this ultimately, I prayed this every night during this, during this mission, Ultimately, it's about making room for Jesus to be born in our hearts, making room for, be, for Jesus to be born in our lives. And so that brings us to the end. That brings us to the conclusion. Each of us has the opportunity uh, to make our way to Jerusalem. 
Let me make let me make one more one more recommendation. One more uh, one more uh, crash recommendation. Maybe throughout the eight days of Christmas, the starting on Christmas Day and going until the octave of Christmas, eight days later, pray the joyful mysteries every day in front of your crash with the with the figures, with the story, with the journey. Make your trip around the beads, as we say. Make your journey around the beads, your pilgrimage, and pray the joyful mysteries every day for eight days. Those are the St. Luke mysteries. They tell the story of Jesus' birth, Jesus' childhood as they're recorded. If it weren't for St. Luke, we wouldn't have any joyful mysteries. We're grateful that we have them. So pray those joyful mysteries to remind yourself uh, and experience the, the birth of Jesus uh, in that remarkable way in the middle of that rosary uh, and, uh, uh, and, and that beautiful devotion uh, that helps us to uh, relive uh, the mystery of Jesus's uh, birth and infancy. So those are the journeys to Bethlehem. I'll, I've gone ahead and finished out the chart. So in addition to the two Old Testament journeys, the two gospel journeys, uh, the journey of Mary and Joseph, the journey of three saints throughout the history of the church, also our journeys, my journey that I was able to share with you today, and, uh, and then the journeys, the journeys that you will take, uh, either virtually or perhaps for someday really, uh, that you'll go and you'll, you'll help the scriptures come alive by being at the crash, by being at the, at the manger where Jesus was born. Okay, let me stop the slideshow now. Okay, uh, I would be happy at this time to answer any questions that might have come up. I think I saw one chat open up. So John asked me, how difficult is it to travel between Bethlehem and Jerusalem? Is the wall more to establish the different areas or to actually keep people out? Um, it is there to keep people out. It is a security wall. It is, it is there because uh, in the late 20th century, there were lots of problems between the Palestinians and the Christians, uh, between the Palestinians and the, the, the state of Israel uh, and lots of violence. And so Israel just finally said, we're, gonna, we're going to control this and we're gonna control it by putting up a wall and checkpoints. I've been there when it's difficult and I've been there when it's easy. As an American traveling, I generally can get through, but because it's a wall with a single lane of traffic going each direction, the traffic can be horrible uh, at various times of the day and various times of the year. Uh, it doesn't do anybody any good to make it hard on tourists, to make it hard on pilgrims, on people who've traveled there for religious observance, because those people are going to keep coming back and they're going to keep spending their money. And so it, it's, it's incumbent on both the, the state of Israel and the Palestinian Authority to make sure that things are as peaceful as possible. And so at various times, it's, uh, it's more difficult than others, but, uh, but it, can be, it can be difficult. I've seen, I've been there at times, excuse me, I've been there at times where I was traveling on, on, the, uh, on a bus, on, a, on a, the equivalent of a city bus where going between, and they made every, every person, the stop at security wall. And again, everybody on the bus is basically uh, American or there, there would be some Palestinians and Jews there, but, but they made everybody get off the bus. And it seemed to me, ultimately, that all they were trying to do was, was make people's lives difficult. It didn't, they, they didn't find anything on the bus, but it was, you know, we were stopped and detained for an hour. Uh, and our passports were collected, those kinds of things. So it was, it, it's, I don't know. I, I could talk more about that wall, but I don't, it, it, it's, it's a hindrance and it's definitely there to keep people out. It's definitely there to control people. Um, and it's an oh, eyesore, it I, an eyesore. Nothing. I would like to say when I was there in 2011, I think- I'm sorry, who's, was, speaking? who's speaking? Oh, Barbara. Hey, Barbara. Right. Yeah, um, our Israeli driver, it, it was, I think mostly Americans, Catholic Jews, and maybe non-religious, um, and they made the Israeli guide and bus driver get off, and we had to change to a Palestinian um, everything, you know, driver, guide, everything. That was the main... What, what year was that? I believe it was 2011 in the fall. In okay. Late August, yeah. September. Yeah. Um, uh, there's also when you're there, when you're there at non non big tourist time. So when I've been there in the early spring and when I've been there in the fall, when it was before Christmas, there wasn't uh, um, 
there wasn't uh, that kind of um, of um, there, there wasn't that kind of um, uh, there, there weren't crowds, and so it was easier. And there's there's two different passages: one that goes to Beth Sehor in, in the in the north, in the northeast, and one that goes in right, right into the city of Bethlehem. And a lot of times, my tour guides have taken us, and our drivers have taken us through that less crowded just to get into the city quicker and get to the shrines quicker. So a lot of it has to do with who you, uh, um, who yeah, you. Yeah, I was, I was on a tour with Dennis Prager. He is Jewish. I don't know if you know him. He's a, actually a talk show host. He's 72 or three. He's, he's out of LA and uh, he's done a number of trips over there. And actually he's writing books now about the, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. He, you know, okay. yeah, I don't, I don't know his work. So, yeah, but, he, but it was it was not bad getting through. But when we got there, it was mass people. I yeah. mean, it was so crowded. I almost didn't want to go into the grotto. My husband made me thank goodness. But I mean, I'm, it glad, was I'm glad he did. A lot I'm sure of, you're glad yeah. he did too. Okay, so yeah. Carmen asked a question. Uh, Father Barton, do the Orthodox believers in Bethlehem celebrate Christmas Day on another day, not December the twenty fifth? Um, so, uh, yes, they, so in much of the world, Christmas day is Christmas day. It's the day in which we celebrate the birth of Jesus, but just January the 6th, the, what was traditionally the date of the feast, the epiphany is as big or bigger. When I went to Spain, I arrived in Spain on, I arrived, arrived in Salamanca where I would be studying for the rest of my sabbatical. I arrived on the 5th of, of January and I could not believe how massive the celebration was for the Feast of the Epiphany on the eve of the Epiphany. So the big town parade, the three kings were welcome. In that tradition, it's the three kings that bring the gifts. And so uh, so three kings day, Los Tres Reyes is a, is a, is a, is a massive celebration. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so that's when, that's when the big celebration among the Orthodox is as well. They celebrate, they, they do have, they do have celebration on the 25th, but really their big celebration is on the 6th of January. Uh, so Wendy asks, Wendy and Jocelyn ask, uh, do you know why the temple is in the shape of an octagon where Mary rested? Many, 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 many churches uh, in, that were built in the Byzantine era, so fifth and sixth centuries, were built in an octagon form. It was a, it, it's, it's a, it was a very popular form for, uh, for religious architecture, Christian architecture specifically during that time. So there are a number of octag octagonal uh, churches and the ruins of octagonal churches uh, throughout the Holy Land that were built during that time. So it was just, it was a style. Um, it, it, it's not... Uh, I don't. I don't know of any particular um, religious significance to the eight sides, but it was it was an architectural style. If you go to the mount, if you go to the 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 Temple Mount in Jerusalem today, which is a Muslim shrine, uh, in the place of the old temple is the the Dome of the Rock. The the picture you've seen often, probably with the gold dome. That church that was designed uh, in that same style, and it's an eight sided an eight sided uh, mosque. With, and it also has a stone in the center as well, the stone on which uh, Isaac er, was, uh, was uh, sacrificed. Um, so John has asked me, uh, in the church nativity on the altar with the star, it looked like there was a hole in the middle of that star. What is that for? Uh, that is so you can touch the ground. So there's marble on that floor, but they want you to be able to touch the ground, touch the actual stones, on in which Jesus was born. The same thing happens on Golgotha. There's an altar. The church is built over the top of the stones, but there's a hole under the altar where you can actually reach your hand in and touch the stones of Golgotha itself. So it's a devo it's for devotional purposes. Okay, that looks like all of the all of the questions that were written. Uh, if I heard you right, John says. Uh, the Christian population is only about two percent. I believe that's right now. I think I, I think the last time I the last time I checked, it was only two percent. There, Bethlehem has always has throughout history been a place that had lots of Christians in it for obvious reasons. Uh, but uh, but again, life has been made difficult by for uh, for the for the Palestinian population, and 
Christians often have relatives other places and they can afford to leave and they have. Uh, there, there's a very, very, you might, off, you might run into people who sell olive wood uh, rosaries or olive wood religious items for people in, in Bethlehem to help support their families in Bethlehem. There are people all throughout the United States who do this. And, uh, and it, is a, uh, it is a way of, um, uh, it is a way of, uh, of helping to support the, the few Christians that are still there. Um, but my experience was that the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Muslims are, are very hospitable. They're incredibly hospitable. Well, as a matter of fact, both in Jerusalem, everywhere, everywhere that I've ever encountered Muslims uh, in the Middle East, they are, they're incredibly hospitable. They're especially hospitable to Americans. So, uh, so that's been my, that's been my experience there. And it's, but, but in Bethlehem, especially. Hold on, I got another question coming to the chat. Okay. Uh, is the Christmas celebration in Bethlehem more of a cultural thing or for tourists? Well, I, 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 I'm sensing a little bit of judgment in that question. It's for tourists. I mean, it's, but the, but the tourism in the Holy Land is pilgrims. I mean, it's, so it's not for tourists, it's for pilgrims. There are people that, that go there at Christmas because they want to be there in the celebration. But as I said, the Muslim population of, of Bethlehem enters into the experience as well. And it is a, so it's, it's very much a cultural expression of the people of Bethlehem. But what the people of Bethlehem are doing are welcoming pilgrims from all over the world to celebrate this important historical event that took place in their city. So that'd be like saying, is the 4th of July celebration in the nation's capital, is that for tourists or just, is this part of the culture? Well, yeah, it's both. Uh, it's, it's, we, we go there on that holiday for a reason, uh, but the people who live there and make it possible are celebrating at the same time we're celebrating. So, good. Um, so, any other questions or comments that I can address before we wrap this up? So today is the 17th of December. Uh, you may or may not be aware that Advent changes on December 17th. Prior to December 17th, from the fourth Sunday before, before Christmas, the four, four weeks before Christmas, the beginning of Advent until this time has really been focused in our liturgy on the second coming of Jesus and reflection and pre preparation for the second coming of Jesus. On December the 17th, for a week, from the 17th to the 24th, the liturgy of the church really focused on preparing for the celebration of Christmas. So today's gospel reading for Mass was the genealogy of Jesus from St. Matthew's gospel. We'll read the Annunciation stories, both from Matthew and Luke, and Luke during this time. We'll read the story of the birth of John the Baptist. All this really preparing us for the celebration that takes place on the 25th. So liturgically, it's late Advent, so it's a good time to begin to think about your crash and begin, even if you don't start putting out now that you, maybe you think about it in the way that I talked about earlier through this late Advent season. What's interesting, so the rest of Advent, the reading would be, the, re, the liturgy would have the liturgy for the Monday of the first week of Advent, Tuesday, regardless of what date it falls on, it's always gonna be the same every year for Monday of the second week, Tuesday of the second week, Monday of the third week. But when you get to December 17th, the liturgy changes. It's always the same, regardless of what day it falls on. December the 17th, December the 18th, December the 19th, they're always this preparation for the celebration of Christmas. So welcome to late Advent and welcome to this time of celebration, uh, of this uh, preparation for the celebration of Christmas. I hope that your participation in this mission will have given you much, uh, much to ruminate, much to think about, much to reflect on. And I hope that this celebration of Christmas will be a great celebration for you for having spent time in these reflections about journeys to Bethlehem. For those of you who live in Antioch, I'm going to be preaching this weekend at all of the English masses at Holy Family Cathedral, uh, Holy Family Old Cathedral. And so, uh, so I hope to meet some of you at mass this weekend uh, if, you, if you participate in the English masses uh, for the for the uh, the parish the the gospel reading is the is the uh, for the fourth Sunday of Advent is the uh, Annunciation so lots to uh, lots to reflect on there and I'm looking forward to to preaching preaching to live people in front of me instead of just to, to Zoom uh, as uh, as 
as the weekend comes around. So again, thank you. God bless you all. Let me uh, end by giving you a blessing. The Lord be with you. May almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. As I said last night, if you, if you want information about pilgrimages, I don't have a pilgrimage planned right now because of COVID. But once I start, I'll keep your name and, and, uh, and somewhere down the line, if you're interested in going on a pilgrimage, let me know and I'll, I'll put you on the list to get information about it when I am able to schedule a pilgrimage again. And, uh, uh, and the rest, in, in the meantime, God bless you all. It's been great to spend this time with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>